Hey, Jeff. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. We're going to run for the next hour, and uh, we have three presenters with us today. Each are going to have about 20 minutes, so we'll split, split it uh, between the three of them. Um, and Jorge Pena is going to start and uh, give us an introduction of plant web optics analytics. And Jorge will set the groundwork for us, the foundation. Alan Chow will take it from there and give us a deep dive into the cooling tower templates. And then lastly, Ryan McGinnis will end the session today with a demonstration for us. And as we're progressing throughout the presentation, please do feel free to enter questions into the chat. And if we have time at the end of the webinar to address them, we will do so at that time. If we consume our 60 minutes um, with presentation and demonstration, I will um, send out uh, the Q&A to all with, uh, with answers, of course. So let's move forward, and I'm gonna uh, pass the baton on to Jorge. And Jorge, just um, prompt me when you're uh, ready for me to um, move forward, or you can take control of the screen too, whatever you prefer. Seems to be self muted. Maybe one. Can you hear anything, John? No. Can you? No. Nothing. He's the presenter. He's self muted. John, can you hear me? Now we can, now we can hear you, Jorge. There you go. Awesome. I really don't know what happened. I apologize for that. So let's get started with this. Um, I'm just going to request keyboard control. So please do. So I can only see you. I don't see the presentation. Chris, put the presenter back to me, and Jorge will be able to so we, we can see the screen. Okay. Now you're the presenter. Jorge, you got it now? Yep, I can see it right now. So good afternoon, guys. Please I proceed. do apologize for the technical difficulties here, <laughs> uh, but we're ready to roll now. So thank you again for joining. So today's session is going to be very focused on the analytics component. That is one of the pieces of the Climate Optics Analytics Platform. Just to ground everybody here in, in the call, right, and, and to get us started, Climate Optics and Climate Optics Platform is composed of three main components. Today is going to be heavily focused on the analytics, but there is two major components that contribute to the analytics. One is that data lake integrating to many sources of information. And then two is the portal, right? It's making sure that cross collaboration from the different business units, from people in the field, all the way people in the, in the corporate offices, from the enterprise facilities get access to this information. The analytics being in the middle 
grabs that information from the data lake and distributes it to the to the portal, right? To the mobility, to devices, to smart the smartphones, and so on. So let's dive in a little bit more into the analytics and what really is the, the plan with optics analytics uh, platform. If we can move to the next slide, please. There we go. So the Emerson framework of the advanced analytics is what we call the operational analytics focus, mainly because Emerson has had these decades of experience in the operational space. As we all are aware, when it comes to the analytics, theoretically speaking, there is four main categories of this, the descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. Some of the questions that we typically ask as we try to resolve a problem with using analytics is what is happening? Why did it occur, right? And then more importantly, what is likely to happen and what actions to take? So throughout this journey, right, as you can see here on the, on the X and the Y axis, when you start looking at it from a prescriptive, what actions do I need to take to prevent an issue that occur maybe a year or two years from now, the complexity to get an answer to those can be a little bit higher. And that's really the, the intent here, right? The operational analytics framework that Emerson has is enabling you to prevent or to provide the information and the insight to get to that complexity. How, how do we enable that or what is the framework? And we're gonna talk about it a little bit more and what is the starting points that Emerson offer. But it's really to focus in also on the lower complexity problems on what exactly is happening and more importantly, why. The why is gonna be tied heavily with the root cause analysis that this platform has. Next slide, please. Before we dive in into really how the platform really works, I wanna set the foundation on these two principles or these two uh, topics, right? The, the principle driven and the data driven. These two methods or, or concepts are really what are driving the analytics platform. When we say principles driven, we're gonna refer to this quite a bit in, in the session, right? is when we say principle driven, we refer to anything that is related to simple engineering uh, equations, such as thermodynamic logs, governing how things are governing. The quick example that I can give you is like we highlighted here for a pump, the efficiency of a pump. Many of us know what is the equation of efficiency for a pump. You know the inputs, you know the output. The KPI in this case is going to be the efficiency. Those are the type of calculations that we have embedded and are, and are readily available out of the box as we're gonna show you in later in the demo, uh, how many of these are already ready to use. Secondly, the rule base, this is when you start tying in the failures and effects of any asset. In this case, we have the pump again, so we can tie it up to the, to the example. But if you have developed your own FMEAs or if you don't have those, Emerson can provide those expertise. As you know, Emerson has been in the operational space for many decades. And those FMEAs, we have over 400 of libraries of, of, of FMEAs ready available that we can embed and digitize. When we say data-driven, if we refer back to the previous slide, right, the, the complexity piece of this, this is where you get to that far end of complexity in the data-driven. In order to resolve or in order to respond to a problem that is mainly data-driven, such as the efficiency of a pump, the questions are going to be a little more complex, such as what is the remaining useful life of a pump? In order to address the type of questions, you need to have the right kind of data. It's not just having data, right? So that's why we call it data-driven, or that's why it's called data-driven. But mainly because we will use equations such as the efficiency and many other such as failure modes as well, we use this kind of information to translate that and do a more of a mathematical approach now to understand how, what is the remaining useful life of this particular pump. This can be applied to any asset, to any process related. And this is where you start leveraging now more, more complex technologies such as the AI or the machine learning. To do some pattern recognitions, so let's say you have a failure that cost you several thousands of dollars two years ago, but you were able to identify the pattern from a, from a mathematical perspective, and now you're gonna be on your path to be able to prevent by giving you the insight to the operator before it reaches that failure mode by leveraging the first principle equations, by leveraging the FMEAs, and by, by leveraging as well something, some equations such as statistical models in order for you to prevent some of this. Next slide, please. 
So as we talked about it earlier, what exactly is Emerson Framework? Well, again, we referenced a slide earlier which highlights the complexity versus the type of analytics or the, or the problem that we're trying to solve. Emerson Framework is, is very robust and very flexible. And then more importantly, very scalable. This is something that we're seeing across many of our customers in installees that they want to be able to address whether they're starting from an asset level kind of analytics or whether they want to address it more from a plant or a process, complex process perspective. But being able to go from that higher end of complexity or start from the lower end of the complexity, that scalability component is crucial for many of our customers and many who are seeking into analytics. Emerson Framework enables you to start from either or, from the asset templates, which are the principal driven, or the data driven, right, to address those, those uh, complex scenarios. How do we do that? We're going to show you in the demo how easy it is to scale some of this from a cooling tower perspective as well, so you can see it on a real, real example. But then more importantly, is being able to address it from a root cause analysis perspective. Many of our customers are asking, why exactly is this asset not performing well? Why is it failing? In order to address that question, sometimes it takes some time to get to that bottom answer. With this framework of, a, of, of Emerson Analytics Platform, you're going to be able to visualize it more intuitively as well. Next slide, please. So, again, whether you're starting from the data-driven or the principles-driven, some of the benefits that you, that you see when you look at it from a principles-driven or templates approach is you can start from this because this is what I call the foundation. If you decide to start with the asset or the component level, because you are creating the foundation of what really good looks like in terms of health or performance by leveraging Emerson's library that we already embedded. Part of the scalability piece of here of this platform is being able to leverage now the complex algorithms such as the AI on ML, couple that with the root cause analysis on the one software, right? So basically you start from a heat exchanger, a compressor or a cooling tower, you understand the performance and the health of this asset, couple that with the root cause analysis. So now when you get into the prescriptive or predictive type of analytics, let's say a year or six months from then, now you will, now you will have, and you'll have the reassurance more importantly, that your foundation is very strong because you have validated and vetted that the health and performance of this asset is good. So whenever you see a failure in the, in the predictive or prescriptive, you're going to be able to backtrace much easily and much more intuitively as well. Next slide, please. And this is really how this platform works. It's very easy. It starts from, you're going to read this slide from the bottom, top, essentially. We grab information, whether it's directly from the field devices, whether these are coming from the machine you're held, from historians, control systems, sensors. We can connect via any, any standard protocols that are out there, OPCDA, HDA, leveraging some of the installations that many of our customers have, right? Leveraging the investments, more importantly, such as the ones from Pi and, and so on. Or by leveraging a, the data lake component, right, that Emerson has as well, being able to connect and, and the data lake becomes that single source of information for us. Basically, the data lake grabs all the different sources and now the analytics component just connect to the data lake piece on this. The way that it, the way that it works is it's a very intuitive software, drag and drop icon, where you're gonna be able to pull in the information, being able to do the analytics, whether it's an offline kind of analytics or an online kind of analytics as well, in being able to implement or embed the knowledge from those 20 plus years of experienced colleagues in our facilities as an object oriented block, as you can see here in, in the image, right, in the rules and actions. If you know why something is going to fail or something is about to fail, if you can translate that into a simple rule, you're way ahead into your journey of, of having a very scalable platform of analytics tailored to your problem or to your use case. Next slide, please. So now let's dive in a little bit more into what exactly and how does it look like when it comes to principal analytics, right? That's, that's really 
We're going to break them down into two so you can actually see how they build uh, from each other and then more importantly how scalable these are. So let's talk about principal analytics first. When we look at the, at the templates, this is what we refer to as a template because it's a library that we have available. You gotta look at it from, from the reliability and from the equipment health, right? And the equipment efficiency, from the actual, from the design of the baseline. This is being able to understand really from when you're selling a new asset or a new facility, being able to look at it from that perspective or being able to set up the baseline to the asset in, in brownfields, right? To be able to understand what looks like and being able to identify much quicker abnormal situations via, via an alarm, via an email, whatever that might be, is being able to have this platform that is easy to configure and easy to deploy. Next slide, please. The way that this works, and this is a simplistic view of this, right? You're producing your operational data on the left hand side, right? This is your live data. So for the templates or principle driven that we're referring to here, you don't need what we call the historical data, right? That takes to a year information. The only thing that you need, and we're gonna talk about it in more detail shortly, is a set of inputs that are gonna drive your KPIs. So the way that it works from a higher level is you grab your real time data on the left hand side, the first principle models that you see the block, the y equals f of t. Basically, this is the functions or the equations or rules that we have embedded in the engine. This, these first principle models or equations are then trigger, then trigger an event generation. This is what we call the notifications or the KPI. And they are sent to a dashboard that we're gonna show you to as well. And it's very intuitive. You're gonna be able to see both health and performance on the same. I'm a visual person myself, and I like to see the asset with the alarms of the inputs and be able to see what input is failing and why, right? And what is the measurements from the baseline, from the design, and what is the operating time here? Next slide, please. So like I said, we have many more uh, templates in here. The example that we're providing you here is primarily on the, what is this, a fixed pump, right? So you can see here, like I mentioned earlier, it's an object-oriented component. So three things that I want you to get out of here. One is the library that we see here, pumps, in turbines, compressors, cooling towers, and we're working now on the boilers as well. Um, but every single asset that you see here in the, in the bottom matrix, every single one of them comes out of the box to be basically install the software, you're gonna get a library, as you can see here on the rules in the image, you're gonna see a library of, of equations. Every single equation is gonna have an object oriented block like this one on the left hand side, that says precavitation or um, the gas attribute. This is the equation that we embed. In the latest release, you're gonna be able to modify and customize the equation that we, that, that, that we embedded as out of the box as well. But more importantly, the dashboard that you see here on the right hand side is also available. This is, this is for you to be able to capture the information like the baseline and set the alerts and notification for the people to in the field to visualize this. This is a web, a web dashboard that can be open via your smartphone, your computer, tablets, whatever that is, right? It's easy access basically. Next slide. So here's the example that we were talking about. Many of these equations in the templates are driven, and this is the example of the centrifugal compressor. And in the next slide, we're gonna see the other example of, can we click in the next slide, please? This is the example of a heat exchanger. I'm not gonna go too much into the detail because one of my colleagues here is gonna be able to show you and walk you through basically from start to end on a cooling tower example. But basically, this is spreadsheet, the way that you will read it is the top column name is the inputs. And the rows that you see here, like the cold approach, mass flow, and so on, these are the KPIs that are coming out of the box. You can intuitively look at it from a perspective of, do I have a measurement or do I have the capability to measure this? If yes, great, I'm getting this KPI. If not, well, the, the platform has the capability to do what we call the soft sensor, a simulated input based on inherently interpolation or something like that, or giving you the flexibility to remove this input. Next slide, please. 
And here are just some examples, and we're going to show you here in the in the live demo, right? Show you the the live demo. But what I want to draw attention to is to the second slide on the lower right hand side. These are the OEM curves, the design curves of the asset. In this case, we were looking at it as a centrifugal compressor, right? But if you if you pay attention to the image, you see a little dot right there, a blue one. That little dot is the operating mode of where are you in comparison of the design curves, which is very important. This translates to you in essentially, if you have those design curves, we can digitize them and incorporate them as part of the deliverable and as part of the dashboard as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so we started with the principles or the templates, but how do you build or how do you start from the templates and build on top of the analytics to, to do a little bit more complex advanced analytics here. Next slide, please. So before we get there, this is just capturing the online capabilities of, of the analytics. So the model optimization, this is the traditional time series, uh, linear regression, clustering, the typical, the traditional offline kind of analytics that, you, that you've seen and that you probably uh, have been playing around and perhaps in, with other vendors or simply in Excel sometimes. But you do have that capability to do so within the analytics platform. But the three other components that you see here, the rules, the root cost analysis, and the workflow, are literally what it composes the heart of this application. The rules and the complex events are basically that, that logic or equation, in a way, that you embed into it. So basically, if this happened, I want you to take this approach. If it's greater than, great, less than, do a linear regression online on the fly and give me the output, right? The root cause analysis is something that is fundamentally strong on this application because it gives you intuitively and visually why something is failing, why it's having a low performance, and so on. The workflow is essentially automation of the steps that any operator might take, or in this case, is automating the steps from receiving the data online, doing the calculation, detecting the normal condition, and detecting the root cause analysis. But if it's about certain threshold, I can generate an email or a work order directly from this workflow, right? So you, this is the flexibility component or piece that this platform has, is the workflow component. You can automate some of these steps, like send a notification, send a work order, notify X person, and so on. Next slide, please. So here is, if you actually look at this one, we still have the same similar graph, it just expanded, right? So this is the template library that we talked about earlier. You have the real time, you have your equations, you have your event generations, and then the KPIs are coming up. So when you start from that point, from those principle driven or templates, and you wanna expand to a more predictive diagnostic or predictive analytics, the platform is very easy to incorporate because now you're grabbing that historical data that you might have from a historian or or a data lake component that you might have or data warehouse. You do the offline analysis, such as like regression, such as a remaining useful life type of calculation or any other optimization. You deploy it and now basically connect it to the event generation piece that you did within the first principle model, right? And now couple that with the root cause analysis here. Now you're going to have a very robust application under the same platform, the same roof, essentially. Look at it from this way. You can start with something simple and then slowly start adding like the offline, the data-driven model, and then potentially the diagnosis, right? The root cause analysis. You can, you can basically break it down into stages or you can start from either or the starting point. Next slide, please. Four, four. Jorge, since we uh, we got started a little bit late, let's let's move on to the. That's a good segue into Alan's piece. If you're okay with that, please. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So Alan, we're gonna connect with you now. You'll have to come off okay. mute. Yeah. Can Can everyone hear me? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, we can. Yes. Oh, okay. yep. awesome. You're good to go. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about the cooling tower asset template. Um, you know, it's an exciting piece of engineering. Um, uh, as uh, Jorge had mentioned, we have uh, uh, we, we developed a number of these asset templates. The cooling tower template was released 
in Plant Web Optics Analytics version 5.3. Um, John, if you could go to the next slide here. You know, from a process perspective, we have a nice little PFD just representing cooling towers. So in essence, just as a background uh, for those who don't understand or know cooling towers, they basically circulate water in a circuit with the express purpose of cooling the water through evaporation. And so cooling towers exploit the properties of water, namely the huge latent heat energy uh, that they possess. And um, this unique capability allows them to cool the water and approach uh, almost wet bulb temperature conditions uh, based off of evaporation. And evaporation, as you can see from the PFD, uh, is encouraged by increasing surface area, spraying water and increasing surface area between the water itself and, um, and, and the air. Um, as well, you can induce airflow through the body of the cooling tower uh, using uh, fans. You, you also have a handle of increasing recirc flow rates. Um, and a few environmental conditions also affect the cooling tower operation, including uh, ambient temperature and relative humidity. So it's a, as you can see, it's a finely tuned piece of equipment with many considerations that uh, that you need to account for in order to optimize its performance and reduce the costs in operating it. So what are some of the challenges that we actually face with cooling towers? What are some of the typical things that we might see? Um, the first challenge might be fouling and scaling that can occur. And that's why we have uh, treatments of chemicals. But it's a balancing act. Too little treatment uh results in you know organic and inorganic scaling and debris that can settle in the cooling tower and of course too too many chemicals is can result in possible corrosion of the components of the cooling tower higher costs of maintenance there's a balancing act um there's also the the challenge of understanding total dissolved solids and how to keep that in check how much do you need to bleed off this cooling tower in order to keep that total dissolved solids in check. And lastly, the stuff that is really exciting, um, monitoring the performance of the cooling tower. So cooling tower efficiency is really uh, optimal after cleaning the cooling tower, uh, rebuilding it and descaling it. And so what we, the question really remains, how much time do we have left before we have to descale? What are the costs of operating a relatively inefficient cooling tower and when does that outweigh the opportunity of running it just a bit longer uh, to get to the next shutdown. So a lot of interesting questions that come up, interesting engineering questions that come up with the cooling tower. Um, John, if you could, could go to the next slide. So um, here we have the cooling tower fault matrix. Uh, uh, Jorge presented a few sample fault matrices. Uh, same deal here, um, inputs, the, all the inputs are on the column side. So just on the top row here, we have required inputs. The outputs are the rows and any of the X's indicate what measurements are critical for each output. So the cooling tower asset template, um, outputs are generally arrived at via principle driven techniques. As Jorge mentioned, um, they use first principle uh, first principles like material and energy balances, component balances, thermodynamics, heat transfer. In short, we're using mainly domain knowledge and subject matter expertise around the asset in order to calculate the KPIs, as you can see. But you know, given the flexibility of the templates and Emerson's advanced analytics framework, we can start with the template and there's plenty of room to build up on that, to build data-driven techniques and methods such as machine learning to enhance the failure detection capabilities of the asset. So what 90, 80, 90% of how we detect failures in essence comes down to first tracking the measurement points. So tracking things like actual cooling temperatures, cooling tower efficiency, evaporative loss. So we get an actual metric of this. But then we also have to incorporate a theoretical model 
from design. And we can arrive at this from historical data, getting a regressed data model. And this can either be static or dynamic, depending on the type of metric that we're measuring. It has to account for modes of operation. And so essentially failure detection is alerting when there evolves a significant deviation between actual versus theoretical. So we'll, th that's really the bulk of um, what we're going to be discussing today, just individual calculations um, with the cooling tower. So next slide, please. So here we have one of the major um, critical aspects of the performance of the cooling tower. This is a psychometric chart just on the right hand side. Um, this really, what, what we're really concerned with is dry bulb, wet bulb, and dew point temperatures. And these temperatures are essential to calculating the theor theoretical limit of cooling for this cooling tower. How, what is good like? How much cooling can this cooling tower really achieve? And so if you manually calculate it um, decades ago, or even now, <laughs> you can use a psychometric chart and you can really constrain the relationship between your dry bulb temperature, your relative humidity, and your wet bulb temperature. And so in our case, when we're developing this asset, we have as inputs your dry bulb temp temperature, which is really your ambient temperature, and your relative humidity. And the output is the wet bulb temperature. I, I wanted to label a third section here called what are the key plant web optics analytics advantages with this, with this section? And we, we hope really to demonstrate what is the key advantage to having this piece of software. Um, so with this template, with the web bulb temp temperature, you can either measure it directly using a meter, but less ideally, you can, you can actually take advantage and leverage the multiple data sources that are available uh, to to Plant Web Optics Analytics Project Studio in order to arrive at a wet bulb temperature. So you, you have things that are needed for calculating wet bulb temperature, that's relative humidity and, and the dry bulb temp. That stuff can be easily gotten from things like the weather network, uh, having a local pan on your site and to be able to actually back calculate your wet bulb temperature from additional data sources. That's the real strength of it. Grab it from a data lake, grab it from, um, from a public website. There's definitely more ways to skin a cat here. So I would say that is, is definitely an, an advantage for, uh, for plant web optics analytics. Next slide, please. So here we have also um, really the primary measurement of the performance of the cooling tower. That's cooling tower efficiency. And the calculation of cooling tower efficiency really involves the range and approach of the cooling tower temperatures. And, um, you know, typically cooling tower efficiency ranges between 70 and 75 percent. And you see why the wet bulb temperature measurement is so, so critical to this. This re really represents how much cooling we can achieve. Um, so what's, what's our advantage here? Um, we need to understand when we're looking at efficiencies, what does good look like? Um, so offline models can be used in Plant Web Optics Analytics Studio in order to arrive at an offline model using the data-driven approach. So we would take historical data from a clean, scale-free cooling tower uh, in a period of time shortly after a cleaning or a rehaul and develop a model, which is really the gold standard from, from which we would actually calculate actual efficiencies. And another possibility, as you can see from the slide deck here, another possibility is actually calculating remaining useful life and not, not worrying about an offline model, using an online model, which is a relatively quick solution. And so you would simply grab data as it comes in across a time profile you pull the data through an online regression block, which could be used to back calculate a remaining useful life. And so really cool way of just arriving, arriving quickly at a key metric, such as remaining useful life. We've done this with suction filters. We've done this with fouling on heat exchangers 
and this type of application can be really extended to uh, cooling tower efficiencies. Next slide, please. So in this next slide here, let's look at some of the, you know, the added bonuses for the asset template. It gives you recommended flows for your blowdown, for your makeup water. And so how does it do this? It basically applies mass and component balance calculations that process engineers use to evalu evaluate evaporative loss, blowdown, and makeup water requirements. So there's a, a there's a principle driven component to this. There's there's even potentially a data driven component to this. Um, what are what do we need as inputs? We need conductivity of both the recirc and make water flows. We need the recirc flow itself. We need a temperature profile of the cooling tower. And um, and you, you might ask yourself, well, how do, how do we get recommended makeup and blowdown flows? We understand here that it's critical to balance these things out. If you, if you don't blow down enough, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna start accumulating TDS, total dissolved solids within your cooling tower and you're gonna have problems. But too much, meaning you blow down too much, then you have to material balance that or balance that with increased makeup flows, which is also problematic from an operations perspective. So there's a balancing act here. What's our differentiator? Plant web optics analytics can readily combine both principle driven and data driven techniques to arrive at recommended flows. So from a principle driven perspective, there's rules of thumbs. You can pull out your Perry's chemical engineering handbook and arrive at a drift loss and evap loss. That was the old way of doing things, grabbing rules of thumb to arrive at what your evap loss is. But this is a perfect opportunity for data-driven approaches to predict these losses. And so the strength of optics analytics is to build a model, grab your historical um, data for your drift losses and evap losses, build a model, really look at what is specific to this cooling tower build models that are um, that are specific to this cooling tower and use those uh, for your main calculations when you're coming to recommended flows. A lot of flexibility here. Next slide. And so lastly here, we're just gonna look at the Langelier, Lang Langelier saturation index and um, really critical metric when it comes to the issue of treatment application for cooling towers. Um, it's primarily concerned with water balance and its pH balance for, for the water itself that's circulating around the cooling tower. And from a chemical standpoint, balance, balancing the water um, pH wise um, is, is really critical uh, in dealing with um, the, the possibilities of alkalinity and corrosion within the components of the uh, uh, of the cooling tower itself. Now, you can't tell, we can't tell you the recommendations from the manufacturer, but what we can do is adjust this calculation and give you a good metric in terms of an early warning system, whether you're running your pH too high or too low in order to optimize the operation of your cooling tower. So what are our main major inputs here? Um, cooling water temperature, pH, alkalinity, calcium, and total dissolved solids. These measurements may be available, but I suspect that a lot of this stuff is just has to be um, measured in the lab and retroactively populated in an historian or limb setup. Um, so what are our key differentiators when we're, when we're looking at all of this, these key measurement points, how are we gonna arrive at the Langelier saturation index? Well, first, and mostly we have to have an available calculation which provides a means of monitoring that. And we do have that. This is part of our subject matter expertise to actually arrive at this type of calculation. Um, as mentioned, it's ideal to have measurements, direct measurements of pH, alkalinity, calcium, and so, so forth. But after some analysis, um, you, you likely might not have these types of measurements. One of the great strengths of plant web objects analytics is to be able to employ soft sensors to build out estimates for these types of metrics. No guarantees, you basically build up the model and you wanna see 
how well from data you can actually you can actually mimic or measure these 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 key measurement points without actually having them. So it's a possibility, and it's another strength that um, Plant Web Optics Analytics offers to our customers. Next slide. I just wanted to recap the advantages of having Plant Web Optics Analytics. And the first, and I keep keep uh, grounding this home, it's modeling. Modeling is a massive advantage. It's cap this capability essentially gives you the ability to build models uh, using our machine learning techniques, exporting those libraries into the online application and fully utilizing them for your optimization. If you have stuff that's in Python or in R, that can be used as well. So we have flexibility here. You have IP and, and your own data scientists who have developed these big models. Go ahead and use them. We have that ability to incorporate uh, all of this stuff. So modeling, big advantage. That's advantage number one. Number two, another key principle in providing failure detection is having a good handle on normal operations, normal operating conditions. And so with modes of operation and for critical assets, it's really important to understand what's normal and what's abnormal. And how do we do that? Well, we uncover this using unsupervised machine learning techniques within Modeling Studio. We grab this data. We're able to actually understand what's normal and what deviates from that normalcy. And things like MSPC, Euclidean distances from the center of cluster, clusters, multiple different techniques that can be used as failure agents um, when domain knowledge fails you. Because very often you can't just, you can't use principle driven for everything. There, there's the gray box, there's the unknowns, there's the proprietary processes, which are, which frankly, you can only arrive at this solution obliquely using data-driven techniques. So this is this is a big advantage as well. And lastly, number three here, just another data-driven advantage, um, using online modeling blocks. I told you I was a big fan of that. I like this block because it requires no offline model. It can be literally implemented in minutes. Um, the attempt is you if the attempt is attempt is to determine remaining useful life. You can throw this block into, um, into the palette. You'd grab a time series of data and basically using that model and seeing if there's a slow degradation within that time series, you can back calculate based off of that model what the remaining useful life is for that particular asset. And we've, as I mentioned, we applied this to fouling, we've applied this to um, efficiencies, um, really cool block. So, I mean, that's it for the coverage of the cooling tower template. There's so much more that can be said, but I think, you know, given our time, um, I'd like to, to um, pass Thanks. this over to Ryan. Thank um, you, Alan. Yeah, thank you. Well done. And um, so we're gonna transition now to the, to, to the demo portion. And in the demo portion, we're gonna focus on the what comes out of the box for our first principle temp, uh, templates and um alan spoke um a lot about both the, our first principle uh, template for the cooling tower and also some data-driven opportunities um, around the cooling tower application and um so we're going to show you right uh in the demonstration now um exactly what you will get with the in the first principle um uh, first principle deliverable and then uh, Ryan McGinnis will provide some commentary too on the on the data driven side as he's as he's presenting and showing you how uh, KPIs are calculated. So Ryan, it's all yours. Thanks, John. Uh, so what what you can see on the screen right now is um, uh, one of our demo systems, uh, the, the actual you know, user interface, the dashboard for all of the the KNet uh, templates that we're running here and and all of the results we're getting. So as, as you look over this, uh, you can see on the left-hand side, the hierarchy of um, our entire plant, starting with you know, the company, plant site, and areas and units within, uh, within the, the overall, um, overall KNET network. So this can have 
know, data from multiple plants or, um, or have data split up, however it makes sense. Uh, we're seeing you know, in the middle the health and performance index as well as um, some measurement statuses. And you know, we can look at those uh, between different, you know, for a specific asset or overall for a unit or area. Uh, also on, on the right, we have the cooling tower up right now. We can see uh, the diagram of the system uh, as well as some specific points shown in, in red there where we have, um, you know, we, we have issues. And uh, this, this chart is showing sort of the, the details of you know, which, um, which pieces those are. So further down, what we're seeing at, at the bottom right now is a list of all of the inputs. Um, so, you know, as, as shown in the default matrix, we have a, a large series of um, pieces of data coming in, and this is for, you know, all of our measurement spacing level, you know, blow down flow, as, as well as uh, vibrations, um, which we'll see in detail later, and uh, different temperatures on our winding. So, you know, here is, is where we would see our, our vibrations. Um, so, uh, back, on, back on the inputs here, um we'll see um wonder if we can find an, an alert and show some of the alert statuses um or hey i don't know if those are available in, in one of the other pages here um or so um we're showing our our centrifugal compressor right now um and here we have uh you know one alert one alert for our lube oil pressure uh, so this is one of the other templates that we have um, that uh, you know, we would have alerts for um, all of our measurements being in or out of the, the limits. You can see there that the lube oil pressure, um, we have uh, 80 kilopascals and our high limit there is 60. Um, you know, this, uh, this view with the health and performance index, again, is available for all of them. And uh, as well as here we're showing the, the bullet chart that actually shows um, the each measurement in, in relation to um, the, the alert limits. Um, so uh, on, on the vibrations as well, or here we'll, we'll look at the curves actually. Um, so this, the, the curves are actually a pretty cool uh, system we have here. You can see you know, where uh, the current operation is on your, your curve. So here's the um, efficiency versus volumetric flow. Um, seeing that you know, for our, um, you know, we're we're right in, in the middle of our range for um, you know, for the the different curves, and it's showing the the current operation point on there as well. And the same on on the other side, uh, head versus flow, um, showing exactly where we are on our curves. Um, uh, why don't we go back to the vibrations? I'd like to just look at you know, we're showing here all of the inputs. If we look at the results, we can see um, some of the um, calculations we're doing on those, whether they're the maximum input or the, the peak view of uh, the vibrations for, um, for that measurement. So I, I want to talk a little bit about um, how we go about actually creating one of these templates. Um, so you know, we have a, a set of input sheets. You know, very similar to the, uh, the matrix that you saw earlier that shows you know, all of our um, uh, all of our inputs and all the measurements we can get out of that. So we'll be taking in you know, those measurements as well as a, a series of uh, constants for you know, that particular device, whether it's um, you know, for uh, compressor, you know, the this diameters, uh, suction um, diameters, efficiency, gas type. Um, and then a set of the, the curves, which we showed, and all of that goes into some pretty default templates. So, um, Jorge, can you pull up the, um, the Kinet desktop or, or what we're calling uh, Project Studio now? So, um, looking at this view, we are actually showing one of, you know, one of the assets. So, this would be the cooling tower asset. Um, what we get out of uh, out of knet is actually a whole set of pre-programmed uh smart object templates um, so that has um you know our cooling tower our compressors uh different pumps 
and all of those have all of our um, so all of these calculations pre-programmed in them. Um, so looking at um, so inside the, the template folder, uh, we have uh, our smart object templates as well as um, so we can make custom templates as well, whether we need to adjust some of the templates that come out of the box or work on um, deploying just the, the default Emerson smart object. So what we get out of that, um, you know, if that if you go back to the K rules, Jorge, um, we get you know uh, a whole bunch of rules that look like this. So you know, here what what we can see is you know, calculations for uh, pH saturation and alkalinity. We're pulling in some uh, pre, -pro pre excuse me predefined values or constants of the system as well as our actual measurements. So pulling in water alkalinity and run status for uh, the alkalinity calculation, and then uh, pulling in you know, the alkalinity calcium uh, return temp, dissolved solids for the pH saturation, and actually showing what that pH is. So um, all of these points come right out of the box in the template. No need to do additional calculations or additional setup. Um, and um, we can, you're actually able to see what the calculations are for each of them as well. So um, you may or may not be able to see that now, but those are available for um, if we're, if there's ever a question about what those actually mean. Um, so Jorge, one, oh, there we go. Um, so why don't we go back to the, um, so there, yeah, there's our, our asset again. This is the representation of that cooling tower. And if we go back to the, um, the user interface, our dashboard, what we're seeing is you know, all of those smart objects that were set up are what we're seeing on the left, on the hierarchy here. So here's the cooling tower that we were looking at. Um, you know, if we go to our results page, our results tab, um, that will actually show us, you know, these are the KPIs that are generated based on all of our inputs. So um, the alkalinity that we were looking at is just that top one there. Um, we see pH saturation as well. So all of that gets pulled up from the Plant Web Optics Analytics uh, platform up to the, uh, the user interface, this dashboard here. Um, so uh, the other uh, very cool thing that uh, is shown here is the performance deviation. Uh, so on the performance deviation, um, you know, we have a, um, you know, a set of these variables of you know, what, uh, what value we're expecting and the deviation from it. Um, so if we look at actually switch back to the centrifugal compressor um, and, and look at the results here, um, we're going to see um, you know, our uh, several other uh, deviations. So we see our overall efficiency. Uh, you can see that um, there's a, a gray line in the middle of what, uh, what value is expected, and then the chart uh, showing that, that actual value we're getting. So we can see the um, deviations there and get alerts based on if, if our, you know, if our Efficiency is falling for whatever reason. Our mass flow is out of our expected range, um, showing all of that data. So it, it's all you know, there and available. Um, we did show the, the curves. Um, so that is, you know, again, that's all set in um, the, the SQL backend and in, um, in the uh, Plant Web Optics Analytics Studio uh, to show exactly, you know, set these up and make them available to us. And then um, the other thing that we can see is we can actually look at historical data on this. So um, if we jump to the trends at the very top, um, we should be able to see some uh, historical data. Um, and uh, Jorge, I'll, I'll have you select just a, a few trends when it loads here. We can look at our, our lube oil pressure, a uh, few others. Um, you know, these 
will uh, all come in for um, the whatever period of time gets selected. Um, so here are our, yeah, our different trends for historical data. And you know, if we're looking at an alert, we can come to our trends and see you know, when did we see it go bad? What was the behavior of that pressure um, you know, before the alert came in? Uh, and you know, compare it to some of the other measurements that were shown. Uh, and then if we go to um, the alerts, actually there's a, a bell shown in the top right that shows that we have an alert up there. Um, and that one is specific to this, uh, this compressor. Um, so we'll show, we can pull up the alerts here. That'll let us you know, show all of the active alerts for that particular uh, asset. And we, we can see here our, the, the lube oil pressure um, went, uh, it went out of the, the limits and we can see when it happened and, and how long it's been in an alert status for. Um, and then finally, you know, there is a, um, a built-in method for setting the baselines and helping to adjust the high and low limits. So if we go to the configuration page, uh, we're going to see our set for the, um, let's go to our criticality here. So, you know, this will let us, uh, you know, set a lot of those alerts uh, as we're you know, working on the process. And there are, um, Let's see, can we actually switch to the alerts, uh, alerts tab? Um, so this, this will let us actually set the, um, the baselines for all of our, um, all of the inputs and all of the KPIs. So there are um, some baselines available if we need to you know, set them up for um, a, you know, a different, um, different running condition or a different season. We could see different baselines based on that. There's a historical mode to let us pull in data and develop a baseline off of uh, that data. And there's a learning mode as well. So it will actually work to develop those limits for you based on um, you know, active running data. So um, see the, the auto baseline at the, the top right, and that is um, the, you know, works to develop those um, in, you know, in the online condition. Um, so there is also an, an RCA tab at the top. So this, um, we that touched on briefly earlier, this is actually going to show um, you know, any uh, RCA trees that um, were available. We don't have any set up right now, but so it will pull in all of that data. All of the, our tree will show us you know, if we have, um, you know, uh, based on our root cause, if we have, you know, a, a compressor failure, um, the, the live data would be shown in the interface. So it'll show we have a compressor failure because of a low discharge pressure, and that in turn is caused by you know, a um, discharge system leakage. Uh, so all of that data is there. It's available for um, you know, in uh, a few different forms and levels of granularity for um, the, the different, uh, different site roles, uh, whether an operator needs to look at you know, what is uh, causing a, a failure here and see some of the root causes or uh, for maintenance personnel to see, you know, here I'm getting alerts on you know, an intermittent high pressure or a, um, a low lube oil level. And um, maybe it's showing what, when it's uh, needed to um, be addressed. So a, a few of the other pieces uh, that aren't shown in the GUI, but um, we can look at in uh, in Project Studio. We do have um, you know, uh, rules that are available to develop. You know, just completely custom rules based on if we want to um, develop you know additional calculations for a specific asset, or we want we want to you know compare a few values and uh, have a um, a custom KPI that's you know either site specific or instrument specific. Uh, that can all be 
developed in uh, in the project studio and um, bring those alerts uh, all the way up to up to the interface. Uh, there's also the option in some of our custom rules to have um, you know some workflow uh, to allow uh, several uh, different levels of notifications. So we can set up uh, events to uh, send email alerts based on a uh, a bad condition, uh, and then you know if it's not addressed or uh, it's still active for a significantly longer period of time, uh, you know, send those alerts to a a wider group. Um, so you know, that's uh, that's kind of an overview of our uh, our actual system here. There's there's a lot to see, um, and uh, it, it is you know very I think very user friendly. You can see all of the data right there in front of you. Thank you, Ryan. So um, we're at the end of our time. Uh, a big thank you to all of you that attended today. Um, thank you for spending the time with us. Thank you to our three presenters, Jorge, Alan, and Ryan. And um, throughout the demonstration, Ryan um, did um, move from the um, cooling tower app to the compressor application. He had also planned to show you a little bit on the heat exchanger side, but as you can see, the, uh, the applications are all built in a very similar manner. And as we add templates to the environment, um, the boiler template is gonna be um, the next one released. Um, we will just continue to add in a, in a similar um, format. You will all see from me, me John Hall, an email um, sometime um, tomorrow that um, will list all of the uh, Q&A that we received. Um, and before you, before you end, uh, your, before you leave the, uh, the go-to webinar here, if you want to uh, send in a question, please feel free to. I will respond to all with all of those questions and answers. And then if you want to spend some more time with us, um, talk more about the cooling tower application, have a demonstration just for your team around the cooling tower application or any of the other templates, um, we would be, of course, very happy to do so. So again, thank you and um, um, enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye.